Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Ed Randall's Talking Rams. Here on this video series, we are paying tribute to those men and women, members of the Athletic Hall of Fame, who distinguished themselves on the field of play and brought honor to Fordham University. We hope you'll pass the word about this series to all your friends in the Fordham community and beyond and have them tune in. We continue our series of conversations with arguably the greatest place kicker in school history. He left our campus in 2012 as the top FBS kicker in the nation, earning consensus All-American honors. That season, he set school and Patriot League records for most field goals and points scored. And if that were not enough, he also holds a school record for punting average in a season. Of course, he moved on to the NFL for three seasons, principally with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Most recently, he was added to the National Football Foundation and College Hall of Fame 2024 ballot for induction into the College Football Hall of Fame. We welcome back a great athlete whose plaque you can see in the Rose Hill Gym, Patrick Murray, Gabelli School of Business Class of 2013, Hall of Fame Class of 2019, and number seven in your program. What a joy it is, Pat, to have you with us. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, it's my pleasure, Ed. I've watched previous installments of this, and I was hoping that it would be me one day, so I'm glad to be here. So, uh, well, you know, uh, the payment that you made under the table to Joe DeBarry makes this possible. <laughs> so, you know, uh, it, we're happy to have you and hope that that didn't put you in a disadvantaged financial situation paying DeBarry. Uh, so, uh, Pat, let's start with this. Uh, what about being added recently uh, onto the ballot of the College Football Hall of Fame. What about that? Uh, it's a dream come true. It was one of the things that I had talked about with my dad the day that I walked onto Fordham University's campus. Um, you know, as a bit of background, my dad comes from a town in Ireland where I think there's probably 1,500 people in total. It's on the northern border of Ireland, a town called Clonus. There's some tremendous athletes there, but not a lot of athletes come and go certainly stateside to play any different sports. So for me, it was always important to bring back some joy through athletics to that town. And I think with this honor, I've done that. And I'm incredibly proud of that. I'm incredibly proud of the work that I put in. I'm incredibly proud to be recognized amongst my peers. There are a lot of people that I'll speak about during this interview that I couldn't have done that without, but truly it was a dream come true to get that notification. Uh, Patrick, when you were a baby, what came first, walking or kicking? <laughs> well, it was kicking, in fact. Before I could walk, my dad put a soccer ball in my crib, and he, he made sure that I knew how to kick it. Uh, I was kicking with right and left foot. I decided to go with my right. That was more powerful, and it stuck with me ever since. I'm still kicking to this day. Uh, it, it, was, was your mom complaining when she was pregnant with you by any chance? <laughs> You know what, if you ask her, yes. Uh, you know, I, I would tell her that I hadn't really developed that whip yet in my leg, but if she would tell you differently, that's for sure. Uh, sports was a big part of your childhood growing up in Mawa, New Jersey, was it not? It was, uh, it was probably the biggest part of my life, and it still is, quite frankly. We were playing a sport outside, whether it was soccer, football, baseball, basketball, anything with a ball, you name it, we were playing. I mean... My dad, he's got quite a voice on him. So when the street lights would go out, you would hear him. And that was your cue to come home. And it was tough to pull him and my, <laughs> myself and my brother in. But we had to come in at some point. Uh, your dad came from Ireland. He played Gaelic football. And he never let you forget it, did he? No, he tells me all the time about this famous goal in the Rana Fast Cup that he scored. And in fact... Uh, for Father's Day this year, I've had it emblazoned on a on a thing that he can put on the mantle that nobody knows about that yet. So hopefully this doesn't come out before Father's Day, but I'm sure he'll uh, he'll still enjoy it. And there were summer trips to Ireland. Tell us about uh, those when you were a kid. I, I like to call them summer trips back home because Ireland is home for me. That's where the vast majority of my family is, That's where I feel my roots it's where I feel most comfortable, and it's really where I feel that I was able to gain not only athletic skill, but social skill, and also develop this passion. You know, Irish people are passionate. So every summer we would go back for a minimum of three weeks, 
again, sports pretty much filled those days, whether it was backyard soccer games with Ushin and Sean, who were my cousins in Dundalk, whether it was, you know, sessions when we got a little older in the bar, or whether it was musical sessions with Paula Colum and Kira and Jonathan in Dunboyne. Those are all my family, so they all get a shout out. And obviously, Maisie, my grandmother, we spent every every night there. It was pretty incredible. It was a great way to grow up. And I'm so grateful to my parents that they brought myself and my brother back each year. Uh, you're 13, 14 years old over in Ireland in uh, in some of the most famous Gaelic football stadiums in Ireland. And you're kicking an American football. Uh, did, it, did, did some of the kids there go, what's this guy doing? We got some very funny looks, I will tell you that. But we always invited the locals over to come and give it a try. And we would explain what we were doing, why we were doing it, and the differences of kicking a Gaelic football and American football. And I can guarantee you, say this with 100% certainty, I am the first person to ever kick an American football in some of those stadiums. <laughs> and and I, would, I wish I could be there. At the moment that you're explaining, well, how does the play begin? Well, a guy goes forward and then he bends down <laughs> over the uh, pad. <laughs> wow. What a, yeah, yeah. What a moment. <laughs> like I said, we got some funny looks. And certainly when you're explaining the process, those funny looks turn into, uh, I really may not want to hang out with this guy anymore. But when you equate it to rugby and a scrum, then they start to understand it a little bit more. It's not... Yeah. They're not totally comfortable with it. They'd still rather kick a round ball than an oblong shaped ball, but eventually they got the gist. Uh, you played Gaelic football as a kid in the uh, Bronx in Gaelic Park. I remember having uh, Little League trophies. They would have our, our, our Little League presentation there at the end of the uh, baseball season in, in Gaelic Park. I remember going to concerts there uh i remember my freshman year at fordham uh fordham played manhattan uh in football it really wasn't football pat it was it was a riot uh and then it <laughs> happened to have football as a background uh because it was a crazy rivalry as you know but so many people i know that are watching this are very familiar with gaelic park and all that went on there it's a it's a monument to irish immigrants it really is you know that area was full of Irish immigrants and still steeped in the Irish culture. And for me, I learned probably from the school of hard knocks, and I mean that literally because I took some shots, what it meant to be a tough athlete. And I credit Gaelic football for my ability to kick and punt at the level that I did. If you go back and watch Fordham film, a lot of what we did as a punt unit, and that's why we were the number one punt unit in the nation my junior year and why we were number two in the nation my senior year, is because we did more of that rollout style punt. And in my view, you know, we'll call that a rugby punt. In my view, it was a Gaelic football punt. It was very accurate. And nobody knew where the ball was going because it could get it on the ground quickly and it would spin and duck and dive. And it's why we were so successful as a unit. So for me... Without Gaelic football, I don't have that skill. Without the camaraderie, the sense of community driving me on, understanding that, hey, I may not be able to go to Gaelic Park on Sunday because we just had a game on Saturday and I'm on scholarship and I don't want to lose my scholarship. Without them understanding and supporting me, I probably never would have reached the heights that I did. So I credit Rockland GAA. I credit the New York GAA just for being there behind me the whole way. Uh, talk about playing football at Don Bosco Prep in uh, mm. Ramsey, in uh, Ramsey, New Jersey. Uh, did you ever play any other position besides uh, kicker? I did not. And there's a reason for that. Coach Toll, and everybody knows who's co who knows who's Coach Toll, right? He's the number one, in my opinion, number one coach, certainly in the state of New Jersey ever in high school football. And arguably him and Bob Latisor out in De La Salle are one and two in the nation ever. So Coach Toll's father is from County Armagh. Obviously, my dad's from County Monaghan, very close neighbors. So when Toll found out who we were, it was very easy. He just said, Pat, I need an Irish guy who can kick the ball. You're my Irish guy who can kick the ball, and that's all you're <laughs> going to do for me. So I said it. I but you, had to, be, you had to be Irish. You had to be well, Irish to get he, the job. 
he knew with the Gaelic football background. His dad had that background. His dad was a boxer wow. as well, and all the poles were. And we grew up there. boxing too. He mm-hmm. knew that we just had something different. We had that background to be able to do something different. And credit to him, he challenged me. He, we were arguably, he said we were the best team in the state. We we're one of the best teams in the country. And special teams were his baby. It was essential to our success. So playing under him was one of the greatest joys of my life. And we had tremendous success while I was there. Before you were born, there was a guy on the New York Giants when they were great in the 60s named Don Chandler. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he moved on to the Green Bay Packers to play for Vince. And he did both. He was a place kicker and a punter. Uh, When you were in high school, uh, did you also do both? I did. And that's what I wanted to do because I knew I had a unique set of skills insofar as I was great kicking off the ground. But with a ball in my hands, I felt very comfortable. That's that Gaelic football background. And I could do things that certainly other teams were not used to. I could kick the ball in a way where it would, it would wobble a little bit more, so it would give the returners a little bit more difficulty. I could kick it end over end. I could kick it sidewinders. I could kick bananas. So for me, that was natural. And I know, but this is the stuff that we worked on. This is the stuff my dad and I worked on day in and day out to make me a weapon and allow us to be successful when it came to field position. I could boot the ball out of the end zone when I was a freshman on kickoffs. There was no issue there. I knew I was accurate with my field goals. I was kicking 50 yarders as a 14 year old punting. I brought that into my arsenal because I knew how valuable it could be to the success of certainly Don Bosco. And I knew how valuable it would make me when it came time for college as well. There was a time when Chandler was kicking uh, that they were all straight on kickers. Mm -hmm. And then a guy named Pete Gogolak came along and he changed the position. Uh, He was an immigrant and he was first with the Buffalo uh, Bills and later came to the New York Giants, changed everything. Uh, Is there an advantage to coming from the side, Pat? Because it it seems like uh, we're never going to see a straight on kicker again, uh, just like we're not going to see a knuckleball pitcher in baseball again. You'll never see a straight on kicker ever again. The soccer style kick is much more accurate. You get more surface area of the football, meaning you're going to get more of a sweet spot on the hardest bone on your foot. And it's much easier to control. You take a lot of guesswork out of coming from a soccer style versus a straight on kick. Straight on kick, you better hit that dead center of the ball, that sweet spot, or else that thing could go all the way to the sideline, left or right. Soccer style, much more controlled, and you can generate more power due to the nature of the angle that your body is at and the angle that your leg can whip through the ball. Was it understood when you were at Don Bosco that you were going to do both, that you were going to kick, uh, that you were going to kick and you were going to punt? Absolutely. I wouldn't have it any other way. I argued that I should do both. Because I was the best at both. That may sound braggadocious, but no. you, you put now up when the you're numbers. 14, Pat, now when you're 14 years old and you're kicking 50 yarders. Okay? <laughs> really? <laughs> but that, it's not bragging. But my, my thought always was best players should play. That's the way that Toll ran his team. And that's the way that I lived my athletic life and certainly my academic life as well. So, yes, it was understood that I was going to do both in high school and in college. I wanted to be the first person to do both in the NFL at a successful level. That was never going to happen because I couldn't hold the ball on my field goals as well. So I had to settle for doing both in high school and college. Through the years uh, at Don Bosco and at Fordham, uh, which did you enjoy more, hunting or place kicking? Well, I had some great moments place kicking, like kicking the game winner in Vail Style on national television for the first cross country high school football game. So that one sticks out in my mind. But then, and, and again, at, at Fordham, you know, the 55 yarder against Cincinnati, the 50 yarder opened up the season, hitting 20 something odd field goals my senior year to break the records and set a new one. Um, but honestly, I enjoyed punting more and there's a couple of different reasons why I enjoyed watching those returners fair catch the ball because they knew they couldn't return it on our team. 
I enjoyed kicking 70 yard punts of which I had multiple. <laughs> and I really enjoyed being able to have the option to go and run for a first down, which coach Moorhead gave me against Villanova my senior year. I felt more like an athlete going out there with a the ball in my hand and punting it. So for me, I think I enjoyed that more. Okay, so uh, let's get on the road to Fordham. Uh, you're told by uh, a lot, for all the success that Don Bosco is having as a team, the legacy of Don Bosco football, uh, the great success of Patrick Murray, uh, still you're told by college coaches that you were undersized for a football player at five feet seven. Uh, so recruitment was, in your words, slow to none. Tell yeah. us how you got to Fordham. So it's funny, uh, Fordham was never on my radar. Um, maybe it's because my parents didn't have any, any experience with recruiting, but they always thought, look, you go where the money is, you go where the scholarship is, you go where the opportunity is, because we didn't have much growing up. We had what we needed, but we certainly weren't you know, flooded, flooded with cash. So Delaware gave me a, a partial scholarship and they said, look, that's a great opportunity. You go there. For me, I knew that Delaware was not where I needed to be. It's a great school, great people, but it's just not where I fit. So I came home after a couple of weeks there in the summer. And my mother had actually graduated from Fordham. And in her infinite right. wisdom, she said, why don't we just go up to Fordham and take a look, see if you like it. Maybe we'll grab some food on Arthur Avenue. No problem. I still think that she had this plan and she won't tell me to this day, but as That's we were what walking, moms do, Pat, this, this, she, and Linda Murray is a saint and she always, it's will in the be. DNA. It's in the mom DNA. I they agree got, with They you. got stuff going on that you don't know. They do. So we're walking through campus and the football team happened to be practicing. So she leaned over to me and she said, why don't you just go and introduce yourself to the coach? Say who you are, where you went to school, and say that you're thinking about coming to Fordham. Why not? What could it hurt? So I go up and introduce myself to Tom Masella, say who I am, where I went to school. He said, okay, send me your highlight tape when you get home and we'll talk. Well, we're in the car leaving Rose Hill and I get a phone call and it's from Tom Masella. He said, look, I've made a couple of phone calls. We know who you are. We know where you went to school. We understand your background. Come back on campus tomorrow. Bring all your paperwork. We're going to see about getting you in and getting you on our team. And that's how I wound up at Rose Hill. Wow. Tell me about the first day on campus. Well, it was different because they didn't have a room for me. So I commuted from Mawa, New Jersey to Fordham. Every single day, my father and I would get up at about 4 a.m. and he would drive me to campus to practice every day. So my day started earlier than a lot of people. But the first day on campus, I felt ready and I felt determined. In fact, I kind of took it as a slap in the face that I was the one that had to get up and get there just to earn my spot. And that's really what I wanted to do was earn my spot. There was no malice towards anybody on the team. That's just how I had driven myself my entire life. I was the underdog. Nobody wanted me. So I was going to show you that I was the best player and I was going to show you why I wanted to be there. Mm -hmm. And really, the only way that I was going to be able to afford that school was if I earned a scholarship. And the deal was, if I was all, count or, um, all conference, my freshman year, then there would be a scholarship. So my focus was being an all-conference punter and kicker. I took over kicking at or took over punting at that time. We had another kicker there at the time that was kicking for the team. I took it over at the end of the year, but I went out and I became an all-conference punter. I was the difference. I set the standard. And from that very first day, when I showed up on campus before the sun was up, I knew that this is where I needed to be, and I knew that I was going to make a difference. Getting up at 4 a.m. And, and traveling across the George Washington Bridge from New Jersey, traffic's not that bad, right? It's not that bad, but it's certainly not pleasant <clears throat> when you're trying to get that sleep that you need to be a high-performing athlete, and you're going right. over the, the, let's say, less than smooth roads <laughs> that New York and New Jersey have to offer. 
Oh, Pat, uh, yeah, you, you're not in New York anymore. You should come now. The streets and the roads are perfect. They're perfect. They're just like they are in Florida. You need to come back. They've all been repaved. Um, yeah. What what uh, what was the attraction for the Gabelli School of Business uh, as opposed to the college for you? It's in the name, Gabelli, Mario Gabelli. That gentleman has been so kind to me since my time at Rose Hill ended. I have nothing but respect and admiration for what he's done, not only for that university, but in his community and certainly the person who he is. I knew that business was something that I was interested in. I knew that finance was something that I was interested in. One, because of the competitive nature. Two, because I knew it was a way for people who maybe didn't come from unbelievable backgrounds to lift themselves up and help others along the way. And I saw what Mr. Gabelli did day in and day out. And I knew that was someone that I wanted to emulate. Favorite subject at Fordham was what? Statistics, because I'm a stats guy. My <laughs> whole life revolved around stats. So if I could figure out how to get myself one to 2% better each day on the football field, I figured, well, that might translate to a statistics course and I might be pretty good at this. That was really what I enjoy doing. I love numbers, I love math, I love working out problems, I love coming up with solutions. So they're kind of stuck, I guess. Least favorite subject? Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, there was a history course my freshman year where, and again, my mother's an English teacher. I grew up reading my entire life. Prior to being an English teacher, she was a children's book editor. But there was a history course my senior year, I'm sorry, my freshman year. And I think we had to read something like 25 or 30 individual books on US history. And the professor was very dry. The exams were, let's just say, not on topic, very subjective. And uh, I look, I got an A in the course, but I would not go back and do it again. A professor, Pat, who inspired you and made a lasting impression? Francis Pettit, no doubt about it. He and I still speak to this day. And I'm actually going to be hopefully speaking to his executive MBA program in November at Lincoln Center. This is a guy who, and if you ask him, I think he'll tell you, I wrote a paper uh, about Gaelic football and Irish tradition and the business of sports. And he still talks about it. He still remembers it. And he gave me a very, very, very nice grade and a great comment to go along with it. And I still have the paper saved in my, my, out, uh, my outgoing uh, mail. And I read it every once in a while because he knew how passionate I was about the subject. He knew the research that I did. And I think it was something that was unique. So that gentleman is and always will be one of the cornerstones of Fordham for me. Who's a Fordham graduate that you admire most? Well, there are two. And for very different reasons. Vince Lombardi is number one because I read his autobiography and his background is similar to mine. How he grew up, the type of family that he grew up in, where he went to school, how he made his name and getting the opportunity to walk out on Lambeau Field and seeing Vince Lombardi's name in the rafters. I got chills and I actually teared up when I did that for the first time because I could feel a connection. Not that Vince Lombardi and I are on the same level, but we've got some similarities. And knowing that that is where that gentleman stood and coached, and now I'm standing here getting ready to go play against the Green Bay Packers, I think it was a culmination of two incredible lives that happened to have Fordham in common. And the second person, a little bit younger, is my long snapper, Joe Sullivan. So just to give you a little bit of background on Joe, this is a guy who is currently uh, a resident, Mount Sinai Hospital. He took on an unbelievable course load while at Fordham. He maintained that course load while being a long snapper on the football team and all the trials and tribulations that an athlete has to go through on a daily basis. 
and he excelled in both. That guy, there was a Joe Sullivan Appreciation Day my senior year every Tuesday. And the reason for that was because I couldn't do my job without Joe. So we started practice early on Tuesday so he could go to class on time, right? <laughs> That's never happened in the history of Fordham football. And I guarantee you it never will. That's how essential this gentleman was to me, to the team, and to what we were trying to build. And now to see how far he has come, the success that he's had thus far, the work that he puts in, it's very, very admirable. And for you and Vince, there's a connection because both you guys made your bones early in your careers in New Jersey. Exactly. There's that Jersey pride that certainly we both <laughs> have. You know, people like to, I don't know, say not nice things about New Jersey. But I will tell you, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. I know that's the New York, New York song, but there's a little bit of Jersey to that as well. Favorite building was what? Or is, I mean, Keating, have you seen it? It's picturesque. It's beautiful. Walking yeah, through those yeah. halls and kind of having, you know, yeah, it's right there, right? <laughs> it's the most beautiful building on that campus. The history that's there from the lecture halls. It, and it's where I spent a lot of time because I used to love going to study hall as well, right? Sister Anne is in there. How could you forget about Sister Anne and the chats that we used to have? So if I could go back and spend some time in Keating, I definitely would. So uh, where did you where did you live? Oh, Two your years at Fordham, O'Hare, Finley. I lived in the uh, in Campbell as well, a new building. Uh, O'Hare for two first my second half of my freshman year, and then my junior year, Finley my sophomore year, and then Campbell my senior year. Always on campus. Uh, favorite hangouts through the years. I mean, it, can I say Howell on this show? <laughs> because yes. Howell was a great say place. anything. <laughs> Howell was a great place to be. Michelangelo's was great too. Um, uh, I've Dagger John, if you want to talk about Kansas. And who doesn't love hanging out on Eddie's Parade? How was the cafeteria food? I plead the fifth. Uh, all right, we move on. <laughs> uh, Josh. <laughs> Jobs you worked uh, while you were at Fordham. So I spent a lot of time volunteering with the Gaelic Society, uh, with some of the intramural soccer teams. I spent a lot of time with the Gaelic football intramural team as well. Just anything I could do as far as connecting what I enjoyed with sports and connecting what I also enjoyed, which was my Irish heritage. So that's where I spent a lot of my time. My goal was to always be the most successful student and the most successful athlete I could be. I, and I give my parents all the credit in the world. They didn't say you need to get a job, but I volunteered my time in other ways and tried to help out as many people as I could while still maintaining that good academic and athletic standard. Pat, take us through a typical day of practice. Wow. Um, okay, so up at probably 5.30, stretch, get loose, head to the cafeteria, grab a little something to eat, get to the locker room, again, roll out, get myself ready for the day, pads on, I'm the first one out there because I need to get loose as far as kicking is concerned, Joe Sullivan isn't far behind me getting loose as far as long snapping is concerned, started off with uh, special teams, whether it be punt that day or whether it be field goal that day, get rolling, make all my kicks, hit all my punts well, work on a couple of things on the sideline while the rest of the team is doing individual drills, jump in when I need to jump in, maybe play some scout safety. I always enjoyed mixing it up out there a little bit. And then at the end of practice, they'd always have a situation where I would go in and make a game-winning field goal. And that was a really, really enjoyable part of my day. It was one opportunity I had where our holder at the time dropped the snap. So I picked the ball up and drop kicked the field goal. And that was the end of that practice. <laughs> wow. Uh, were there dreams of the NFL at 530 in the morning? There were dreams of the NFL at 530 in the morning since I was probably 16 years old. I knew that I could play at that level. My dad and I would watch the Giants and the Jets on Sundays, and we'd look at each other and say, you can do that. Why not? So that was the dream, and that was the goal. Going to Fordham, 
I knew that it was going to be an uphill battle. Being, you know, five nine on my best day, I think five seven was selling me short just a little bit. But being five nine on my best day and 180 pounds, I knew that it was going to be an uphill battle. I didn't pass the eye test. But as soon as I started putting up numbers and seeing those scouts come to practice and hearing chatter, participating in the junior day, and then certainly when senior year rolled around, I think we had, I think we had at least one scout at every practice. I knew that there was a real opportunity to make this a reality. When did you first detect there were scouts looking? Well, a junior year, we were the number one punt team in the nation at any level, net punt. And that's really what colleges, or I'm sorry, professional teams are looking at. So when guys started coming around wearing NFL logos, I said, oh, this could be really interesting. So I participated in the junior day, did well there, put up some good numbers, no kicking involved. It was all measurable, you know, running, uh, height, weight. Apparently they needed my hand size as well for whatever reason, but no problem. You can have my hand size. And then senior year rolled around. I spoke with Joe Moorhead as soon as he got there. And I said, look, I want to do both. He said, okay, you're going to do both. And then I made the 50 yarder to open up the season. Then I started seeing more and more scouts come around, really paying attention to my field goals, really paying attention to my kickoffs. And then I said, okay, this could be real here. So my focus was on one, putting on a show, certainly on Saturdays when we played, but also putting on a show Monday through Friday when we were practicing. Was there an NFL kicker that you admired? Adam Vinatieri. I know that may be a cliche answer, but I remember reading an article, my uh, probably sophomore or junior year of high school. And one of the things I'll never forget, it was a quote from Adam Vinatieri. And the question was, how do you know that you've made a kick? He goes, well, I got to be honest with you. I don't see the kick going through the uprights. I keep my head down because that's part of my routine. That's part of my process. I want to be like a golfer where I'm looking at the ball until it comes off my foot the crowd will let you know whether or not you made that kick. And that's the way that I always operated. I didn't know if I made the kick or not. I let Brian Wetzel tell me after he was done holding the football for me. So uh, let's move to this. Describe, Pat, your job of trying to kick a football in less than 1.3 seconds. Well, it starts with trust. If I don't trust my long snapper, my holder, and those guys up front blocking for me, I can't do my job effectively. So that's the number one thing you have. I was fortunate. In my mind, Joe Sullivan is the best long snapper that ever played in college football. He was the most accurate. He was the most diligent. And he took his job the most. The, he was just so serious. It was unbelievable. And I had arguably the best hands in America in Brian Wetzel. So when you got those two guys – you can do your job pretty effectively. We got that thing down to 1.2, 1.19 at times, because I knew as soon as that ball left Joe's hands, it was going to be in the spot. So I just took my steps as normal. We worked it and worked it and worked it. And it's all about repetition. So to know that the ball was going to be in the same place every time, that they were never going to be laces facing me, I could just take my jab step, one, two, kick, and the ball was going to go where I needed to go. Uh, were there moments where it all went wrong? Because when you watch it and it goes wrong, you feel such sympathy for the kicker. Yeah, there were definitely moments where it went wrong, but that's kind of what we sign up for too. If you don't think you're going to miss, you're probably in the wrong profession. But more importantly, it's about how you can bounce back from something like that. I've missed kicks. I've missed important kicks. I remember in the NFL, I missed a kick to tie the game on uh, – uh, Monday night football. I'm sorry, not Monday night football on Sunday night. It happens. These are the things that you go through as a kicker at the highest level. You know, it was a 54 yard field goal. I should have made the kick plain and simple. That's my job. What did I do the next week? Well, I came back and I hit four field goals against Carolina Panthers. This is just what you're supposed to do as a kicker. You make a mistake. Okay. You come back, make the next one. You're a quarterback. You throw an interception. No problem. Come back, get the next one. It's about having a short-term memory. That's really what it comes down to. And when you've earned the respect of your teammates by the work you've put in Monday through Saturday, 
they understand things are going to happen. They may not like it, but that's just the nature of sport. So if you can come back from something like that, that's really where you make your bones. Not unlike closers in baseball, got to have short-term memory. Exactly. How did you handle the pre- Pat, how did you handle the pressure? I never felt pressure. You got to understand, I wasn't supposed to be there. By all accounts, I beat the odds. So every single day to me was an opportunity. It wasn't, uh, oh, there's, you got to do this, you got to do that. There's pressure. You're the guy. I never thought about that, ever. Again, my dad came from a town of 1,500 people. You would not know it if you didn't know that you were in the town. You'd pass right through it. So for us, this was great. Are you kidding me? I get to kick a ball for a living? It was incredible. So I never felt the pressure. And that may sound weird, and people may think that I'm lying, but I really never did feel the pressure. Maybe it helped that I was on ESPN as a high schooler playing for Don Bosco. Maybe that helped. Maybe it helped that I had the best long snapper and holder when I got to college. And I didn't even have to think. And then in the NFL, gosh, it was great. I knew my family was watching back in Ireland. I knew my friends were having the time of their lives getting drunk while watching me on Sunday. It was great. Are you kidding me? And so I missed a kick. No big deal. I'll go make the next one. I just... They say pressure makes diamonds. That's definitely true. But for me, I, I went out there as loose as can be because I knew that most people thought I shouldn't be there, but I knew I should be there. Could your friends though watch you uh, perform your magic without getting drunk? Could they they certainly could. Yeah, absolutely yeah. they could. Maybe they just preferred one way or the other. <laughs> I remember coming back to some... Please come back some pretty interesting text messages after games. Let's just put it that way. (laughs) Did they make any sense? (laughs) If you had read them at the time that they had sent them, maybe, but certainly a couple of hours later, no, they did not. 